Um, uh, hello and welcome once again. Uh, today's webinar is presented by Intech and the title is Deal Makers versus, versus Value Creators. Um, I am your moderator. Uh, my name is Judy Ward and I work as part of the marketing team uh, here at IIBA. As you all may know, IIBA is an independent non-for-profit professional association serving the global business analysis community. A recognized thought leader, IIBA is dedicated to elevating the discipline of business analysis, and we provide our global community with relevant tools, resources, and networking opportunities to take control of your career. Before we get started, um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping um, announcements. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A section in our webinar at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, and then today's webinar recording and the corresponding PowerPoint presentation will be available on our IIBA webinar archives page within 10 business days of broadcast. Today's presenter is James Proctor. James is the Director of Professional Services for the Intech Group, Inc., and author of Mastering Business Chaos. James frequently lectures on organizational transformation and serves on the board of several non-for-profit organizations. In Mastering Business Chaos, he reveals underlying patterns he has discovered in thousands of client interactions, ranging from Fortune 500 to emerging growth companies and government agencies throughout the spectrum of the industry. James specializes in organizational transformation, strategy execution, digital business strategy, and digital transformation, business processes, engineering, and IT modernization, including ITSM and ITIL, enterprise application of software, business and systems analysis, utilizing model-driven analysis techniques, and big data and analytics. He has conducted hundreds of organizational transformation projects for commercial and governmental clients across numerous industries, including financial services, telecommunications, media, insurance, public utilities, manufacturing and distribution, government, healthcare, and education. James is the author of Intex highly acclaimed business analysis training series, including business process modeling, business process management, business systems analysis, agile business analysis, logical data modeling, advanced data modeling, big data and business intelligence, effective business cases and requirements management. And these courses have reached over 300,000 businesses and IT professionals worldwide. So over to you, James. Uh, we are happy that you're here and we're very excited about your presentation. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, let's just go ahead and get started. Thank you for that, uh, that introduction. Covered a, <laughs> covered a lot of ground and I appreciate it. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Our time is limited. Uh, our time box is to about 40, 45 minutes. So we have some time for Q&A. Uh, this particular webinar kind of grew out of, I did a uh, uh, I was speaking at a conference in Las Vegas a few months ago, and it was a, a conference that uh, had to do with uh, uh, M&A professionals, private equity professionals, and things like that. And uh, the concept was, you know, the concept of deal makers versus value creators. And the reason I was speaking at this particular conference is to illuminate, there's a lot of people, you know, the deal creator side, people that go out and find deals and negotiate deals and celebrate the closings of deals and all that. And that's, that's really important work. But sometimes the other side of the equation, after that uh, acquisition is completed, right, then somebody's got to make it work, right? You got to integrate the companies, you got to create value and, and all these kinds of things. And so what, you know, as business analysts, and I'm really speaking through the eyes of business analysts here, we are really the value creators, or at least the enablers of value creation in organizations. So I just want to make that distinction here is deal making and value creation are, are different concepts. They're both important. But really, in terms of, of success in the kinds of work we do is, is whether it, we're integrating the emerging acquisition after the, after the acquisition or applies to just organizations in general. One of the things we're continually trying to do as business analysts is, is through operational excellence, business process reengineering, all the kinds of things we do, is really create more customer and business value because that makes the organization more valuable. So I'm going to talk about today is, let me just get my laser pointer on. 
Just a quick introduction here. Um, Talk about the, uh, which we've done, the foundation for creating customer business value. What, what does that really mean to create value and customer value and operational value and those kinds of things? Uh, then I'm going to talk about some tactics, right, just to help us understand tactics for effectiveness, for efficiency. And I'm going to want to make an important distinction between what I call the, the two levers, the big E and the little E, effectiveness and efficiency. And then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the kinds of things we do and ensuring that they're aligned with organizational st uh, strategy, operational strategy because those are the kinds of things that it's important. There's a lot of great ideas for improving process and creating value, but unless you're aligned to a strategy, right, we're probably not moving the needle in strategy. And all the kinds of projects we do, they're all, very few organizations have unlimited time and budget and resources. So we kind of you know, figure out which things create the most value for an organization. And then we'll uh, do some Q and A. I'd like to, a little quote I, I made during the conference is money flows to where it's treated best. Now, Whoever, the better we are of stewards of our budgets, right? And the more value we create through our budgets, the money they allocated, the more likely we are to get increased budgets, better budgets, better funding, and these kinds of things, which is important to the kind of work we do, right? So the better uh, we, we deliver, uh, and I'll get into that whole concept in just a little bit. So let's just go ahead and move on. Just to create, some, and this is not an M&A uh, uh, webinar by any means, but I just want to kind of create a little context here. Uh, a lot of a lot of big deals go on. You know, uh, Microsoft last year, 2022, acquired uh, Blizzard for uh, 68 billion dollars, and Broadcom acquired VMware for 61 billion, and so on. There's a lot, and, and thousands of thousands of deals out there. Right. So here's the point I want to make, and this is the point I made in the conference, and I'm going to then we'll move it over into the world of business and analysis kinds of things. Deal makers create potential deal making value on the buy side. So if I'm a deal maker. Right? What am I doing? I'm looking for acquisition opportunities. Right? That adds some value, finding good opportunities. And if I'm buying at the right price, right, that provides some, some value through, through the buy side. Maybe I improve the capital structure, look at debt, lower cost of debt, and these kinds of things. The point I want to make here is the deal-making side, the buy side, doesn't really impact creating. It doesn't do anything for the cost, our customers. It doesn't create value for the customers. It doesn't create value operationally. And that's really the focus I want to make a distinction here about is, yeah, you know, buying right, buying companies, do those things is a great thing to do. But really where the value is created is for creating value for the customers, uh, creating value out of, out of our operations. And that's really what I want to talk about today. Because on the deal making side, they do these kinds of things and they close a the deal and have a big deal, you know, making a uh, closing party and all those kinds of things. And then on Monday, people like me and my team come in and <laughs> we'll have to start stitching these uh, companies together. So we'll talk about uh, that. But the point is, uh, deal makers and deal making, right? Great headwind, right? To improving value, but really it's about creating operational value, company value, customer value. That's where the value is created in an organization. All right. So just a couple of bullet points there. Right, so we talked about that. It's a nice tailwind, but that's not what creates value. Creating value, the improving operational and customer value is really the domain of what we do. Uh, business analysts, uh, operational execution, you know, those are the things we're involved in. So we are the value creating side of that transaction. So in other words, business analysts, technologists, functional operators are, are the value creators in the organization by continually improving an organization's value creation, well, the people, the processes, the technology. That's what adds value to an organization through improving our operations and creating customer value. It's just that straightforward, right? So continually creating and improving business value, improving operational customer value, that only applies to M&A. So, so we can put M&A off to the side right now. It applies to all the kinds of things we do for an organization to thrive and survive in today's hyper-competitive environment. So our organizations are evolving. We're, we're continually looking for opportunities to improve process, implement technology to improve uh, operational effectiveness and efficiency. All right. So I want to dwell on these. There's a couple of slides here I want to dwell on for a while and go deep. So I find that understanding, because that's what we do. I mean, that's what we do. Creating value is our job. Right? We do it through what I call the big E and the little E, effectiveness and efficiency. And a number of you that have, uh, are on today's session, some of you have been to my training courses. Some of you have been to some of our other webinars. I always you know, lead with value and the concept of customer and business value. 
So let's break it down here. We're going to break it down a little bit more detail than I normally do in a, in a webinar because it's such an important point in the context of what we're talking about here. So effectiveness, the big E, right? It's about creating customer value. So in my opening slide, the buy side doesn't create customer value. The buy side does a good job of maybe buying right and finding the right opportunities, but doesn't it do anything about improving value for our customers? Because ultimately that's what creates value for our organization. So if we're creating value, and when I talk about in our context here, customers can be exter internal customers and external customers. Many of us are providing value internally to different parts of our organization. And the organization as a whole is typically creating a value for ex external customers. But it's the same concept, internal external co customers were providing value. So value comes down to four underlying simple questions. Simple to ask, a little bit more complex to answer, right? Who are my customers? You said simple. Who are my customers? Internally, who are my customers? Externally, who are my marketplace customers? And then I ask the question, what are the products, what are the goods and services that I provide to those customers? It's just that simple, right? That's what we do, provide goods and services. Internally, we're probably providing services to other parts of the organization. Externally, our organization is providing goods and services to external marketplace customers. Question number three, what do my customers want? For my products in terms of utility and warranty. All right, now this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. We're asking what creates value for my customers? Utility and warranty. Utility is basically asking question, you know, what are my, you know, do, do the products and services I provide, do they, you know, do they do, are we providing the kinds of things that customers want? The flip side of that is warranty says, and do we do a good job of it? Does it work, right? So utility and warranty. Some examples of that might be like use and purpose. Are we providing products that have good fit for my customers' needs and expectations? That doesn't mean it has to be perfect. It just has to be aligned with their needs and expectations. Sometimes in, in the world of agile and software development, we talk about MVP, minimally viable product. And really what minimally viable product means is the product I'm providing or the service that I'm performing, does it meet at least a minimal threshold by what my customer is looking for to create so they can create value through what I'm providing to them. Now, that doesn't mean that's our goal is to provide the minimally viable product. It says that, but that's the minimum threshold. The question is how far above it can we get given time and budget and resources? But are we providing the right kind of products to our customers and services? Um, you know, uh, are we doing it in a timely manner? Can they get it in the time and, and, and what they want in these expectations? The quality of the output, right? Is it a good quality product? Is it meeting expectations kinds of things? Uh, are we providing the kind of levels of customer service? And many, many, many other things. So we're really asking the question, question number three here. Right? What do my customers want? It's just that straightforward. So, so far, our three questions are, who are my customers? Right? What are the products that I provide to those customers, goods and services? And what is it through those products that provides value to my customer? What are they really looking for? Then if I can answer those kinds of questions, then I can think about how to optimize right, what I'm providing for my customers. And the last question we would ask is, what are my customers willing to pay for my products and services? Now, in the marketplace customers, right, external marketplace, there's, there's you know, the pricing of our products. Internally, we might have service level agreements and things like that. And that's important to establish internally our service level agreements, because if we ask our internal customers, you know, what do you want? What do you want? Well, they want it all, right? They want 24 by 7 customer service and they want, you know, people standing by all the time and they want, you know, you got to kind of balance that off, right? What do you want? What, what, what do you want to pay for what you want? Right? So that's the concept. Now, that's effectiveness. Effectiveness is asking, how do we create value for our customers, internal or external? That's the biggie. The lily is efficiency. Efficiency is a misunderstood, often a misunderstood concept. Efficiency is creating that customer value in the most economical manner, right, to provide our utility and warranty at those predefined service levels. So efficiency is saying once we've defined what we're, what we're providing and what levels of, of we're providing quality and service and those kinds of things, efficiency says if we can provide that, but we can operate more economically, lower our cost of doing business, Right, and still provide those levels of service, that's efficiency. Vectorms is about creating the value, external value for our customers.
efficiency is about doing it in the most economical manner, which creates is a component of internal, co uh, internal company value because the more efficiently you operate, the more gross profit margin given our, our products and services. Now, the po other point I want to make here is that I'll just put up a couple of things here. Dr. The bottom one here is efficiency and cost reduction are not the same. They often get mixed up. Efficiency is about providing our products and services at those service levels that we've defined in the most economical way. Cost reduction is about reducing our cost of operations by lowering our service levels or whatever those levels are, which is a fine. If we're operating at levels of, of, of quality, we're working at levels of customer service, we're providing levels of effectiveness beyond which our customers recognize value from, then we we'll probably want to look at lowering those values, right, in order to reduce our cost of business, right? And we have to be very careful about that because just cost cutting, just saying, you know, we get a mandate, we got to cut cost by 30%. We can always call, cut cost by 30%, but what's the impact of that, right? Because if by slashing cost by 30% in a certain area impacts, right, our effectiveness, then we're going to lower our revenue because we're no longer providing the value to our customers that we did. So just slashing costs by itself without looking at the impact on effectiveness is just uh, not a particularly winning strategy, okay? So you, you get the concept. So here's what I'm going to do. It's just a short little exercise I'd like to do. We're not going to go into breakout groups here. We've got a lot of people in this particular webinar. But what I'd like to do is just for yourself, just answer those questions in your own mind, right? Think about you. You can think about from your perspective, what role you play in the organization. You can think about it from an organizational perspective, but answer these questions to yourself. Who are my customers? Okay. Once you define who your customers are, ask yourself, what do I provide to those customers? Again, it could be you uh, internally, it could be the organization, but what do I provide? What are the products and services that I provide either to my marketplace customers or my internal customers? Then ask yourself the question, what is it really that my customers want out of me, out of the organization, out of those products or services? Is it, you know, uh, you know, a superb quality of the output? Is it about timeliness of the delivery and availability? Yeah. Is it about you know, exceptional customer service or some level of customer service? What is it they're looking for right? in interacting with the organization or you, right? And think about what they're willing to pay. Because what somebody's willing to pay is a function of how much value you're creating. Now, when I say pay here, in your case, you don't you know, don't go all too much in the question number four, right? You have market price pricing for your external customers. You probably have customer service levels. But let's take a minute. I'm just going to pause for a minute. I'd like you to focus here on just these first three bullet points here right? and in your own mind. All right, off you go. One minute. I'll start a little stopwatch here and see where it takes us. Okay, it's enough time to just kind of ponder that a little bit because we can't really talk about you know, improving process, improve your know, re-engineering process, automating process, all the kinds of things, integrating new uh, uh, supporting technologies to understand what it is that creates value because that's what we're really focused on is how do we take our levers of improving process and, and these kinds of things unless we're improving value for our particular customers. Okay, so let's move on. The way to think about this is co-creation of value, right? So what we're doing is 
enabling or, or improving the things we do in the organization, right? We have outward facing processes that touch our uh, other outside customers, sales and delivery and production. We have internal supporting human HR, finance and IT and so on and so forth, right? So we're trying to or organize and, and, and re-engineer and improve our internal operations to create value. Because what we're really doing is co-creating value for whoever our customers are. Those could be internal customers or external customers. So we're creating value for our customers to enable them to create value for their customers. So it's that co-creation of value. The better we support maybe some internal functions with IT, some new functionality, they can do a better job of doing whatever they do. Or we improve a process here and make it leaner or more efficient, right? Enables the organization to operate in a better way, right? And that enables them to now help our customers better as well. So the concept of co-creation of value. The way to think about, we just have a couple graphs here. We don't want to go too deep into macro and microeconomics here, but you get the point. All right, you'll get the point here. Is think of effectiveness as a proxy for revenue and revenue growth. The more effective we are in what we do, the more value we're creating for customers, right? That's going to impact revenue over time. The more efficient we are in operation, that really impacts our cost curve. So over time, we're going to, hopefully we're going to reduce cost and improve revenue. And those are not are mutually exclusive. By doing the kinds of things we do, we can improve revenue, increase our value, and increase that value at an at increasing level of efficiency and being more economic in what we do. So gross profit should increase over time as well. That's our goal. Okay. Now, one last little graph here. When we look at internal operational improvement, process reengineering, these kinds of things, there's really two components. One is ongoing continuous improvement. And the other is strategic uh, transformational BPR kinds of things. They're both important, but we're gonna look at them at a little bit different here. I call this business as usual improvement. All day, every day we're out there, we're looking at operational, operational supervisors, managers, business analysts, we're continuing to look at ways to make our operations, our business processes more effective, more efficient. Maybe we're gonna shave a little cycle time here, improve the quality output a little bit over here, improve a little customer, whatever it is. Incremental ongoing improvement, absolutely important, right? To basically uh, kind of keep, keep the wheels on the bus, right? But on a periodic basis, right? Because of changes in, in strategy and market conditions and things like that, we're gonna go through some transformational initiative. We do some uh, business process reengineering, IT modernization, very strategic because as our strategies change, we need to kind of rethink, reorganize, refocus the organization, to be able to meet those strategic objectives. So, business process reengineering kinds of things we do on a periodic basis and that really moves the needle, right? Improving effectiveness and efficiency, but ongoing, continually, we're incrementally doing process improvement as well. All right. So let's build upon that a little bit more now. Our a background, I talk about this a lot in the training courses, and I've talked about this in other webinars as well, is there's five underlying questions. The way I think about analyzing an organization and engaging our subject matter experts, to really think about these five questions. Now, these questions, we don't go and say, hey, I got five questions for you, one, two, three, four, five. This is really a, a framework for critical thinking and engaging the subject matter experts in the organization uh, in analysis. What is the current state question? What are we currently doing? Because until we know what we're currently doing, it's very difficult to think about where we need to go to improve, to move into the future. Now, stay with me for a second as we go into question number two, three, four, and five. I got us, uh, it's, the current state is so important because unless I know what I'm currently doing, it's hard to transition to something else. Now, in question two, though, let's think about this. In question number two, I'm asking the business question, of all the things we're currently doing, what are the kinds of things I'm currently doing that no longer add value, consume resources, but don't add value, we just need to stop doing. Right? This is where we start leaning out the organization. We're looking for you know, waste and inefficiencies and the current things we do. So here's, here's what you find. Of all the things we're currently doing, all the processes, all the work activities, all the things we do in an organization, I would say on average, I've done you know, thousands of projects here, on average, you're probably going to be able to eliminate three to 5% on average of the work you're currently doing. 
maybe sometimes as much as 10%, but three to five is kind of the relevant range there. And think about it, talk to your subject matter experts. We've talked to the group here and had a big open discussion. I guarantee you we'd find hundreds of examples of that across all these organizations. But just talk to your subject matter experts and just ask the question, you know, what's bugging you about the process? What are the kinds of things you're currently doing that just you don't can't see a clear line of sight of why you're doing it? And just stand back and listen. <laughs> and they'll tell you, yeah, man, we're doing this kind of thing. Somebody made a procedural change or something because something happened over here. We're doing this kind of thing here. And the driver for that's long gone, but here it is 10 years later, we're still doing this thing and it doesn't really make any sense. Or you know, somebody made a change here because some regulatory thing over here and that regulatory thing is, you know, requirement is long gone, but we're still doing this thing over here. Guaranteed, you're going to find all kinds of things that don't make sense. Or really, when I don't say sense, what I really mean is no longer add value. So just listen. Now, what's cool as a business analyst here is uh, the, the staff, the subject matter experts kind of people, they generally, you know, they can't unilaterally just say, this doesn't make sense. I'm going to stop doing it. But you as a business analyst can add a lot of value right there. But just take a look at the things they have identified that don't make sense, analyzing them a little bit, look at the cost, look at the value created, uh, and build a little business case or just stop doing it. And I guarantee you, you don't have to go more than two or three levels in the organization, first line supervisor, uh, you know, first level manager, and somebody's going to say, man, I didn't know we're doing that. That's crazy. You know, let's just stop it. <laughs> so that's some really low hanging fruit. All right, now understand the, the, the context here. So first of all, we understand what we're currently doing. We challenge the current state by asking, what are we currently doing that we don't need to be doing? So in question number three, what we're really left with are the things that we're currently doing that we want to continue doing, albeit we want to do it better. All right? This is an important, it's not subtle. 95% of what you're currently doing, that's why the, I said the, import, the current state matters. 95% of what you're currently doing you're going to continue doing. I don't care how transformational business process re-engineering, uh, you know, you're still going to be doing 95% of what you're doing as you transition to current state. But you're going to be doing it in a more effective, efficient way. Maybe we're doing something over here in customer billing. We've got some spreadsheets we built over here because the current uh, transactional customer billing system doesn't do certain things that we need to do. So we had to do it offline here in a some spreadsheets. Well, there's something we want to take a look at because as we go into the future state, Right, we're going to look at that, identify some functional business, business system requirements for that. And so we transition to the future state, right, where maybe we're going to build some functionality there. Or maybe we're going to reorganize the process, maybe perform some things in serial versus parallel. There's you know, thousands of things we can do. But the point is, we're going to take a look at what we're currently doing and look for opportunities to do what we're currently doing that we want to continue doing more effectively, more efficiently. We can look at question number four is now we're doing a little bit more forward-facing kind of thinking. We're really asking the question, what are the kinds of things that we need to be doing and we know we need to be doing, but we're not yet doing because we can't? Right? We need to do them. They need, they'll add value. Customers are wanting these things. Operations are wanting these. There's certain things, but we can't do them, even though we need to do it because maybe we're constrained by technology. Maybe we're constrained by some, some policies that need to be changed, whatever it is. So. We're going to start looking at those kind of things that we talk to people. What are the kinds of things we need to be doing going forward that we're not yet doing? They go, well, we, need, we need to be doing this, that. Again, as a business analyst, we're going to analyze those, that, look at the value uh, contribution there, the cost of doing it, and build a business case around that. The number five, called the unknown unknowns. The unknown unknowns, which we have to work on as business analysts, are what are the kinds of things that we need to be doing, but we don't know we need to be doing. But if we knew to do those things, we would. We could, right? And there's plenty of things out there. In an organization, we kind of know what we know, we kind of know what we think we know and what we need to be doing. But sometimes we have to look outside the organization a little bit, see what others are doing in industry. What are some trending things and talk to our customers and what are they looking for and things like that. So there's a lot of things that maybe we don't know about, but if we knew about them, we would. Now, that, those five questions, as straightforward as they are, perform a very powerful framework right, for how to analyze your operations, your organization, your business processes, and these kinds of things. All right, so keep that in the back of your mind. All right, so just 10 ways. I mean, there's, there's hundreds of ways uh, to improve the effectiveness and efficiency, but I'm just going to throw out some things here, just to, some things that just, you know, are pretty good standard kind of things, and if you're not doing them, take a look at. All right, improve the quality of the process itself. When I mean the, uh, talk about quality here, I'm really talking about 
errors, with question number two kinds of things. What are the kinds of things that we, we we're doing that we don't need to be doing? Let's stop doing. Let's you know reduce rework, errors, waste. Those kinds of things consume a lot of uh, resources, but don't add value. So let's let's do a better job of eliminating those kinds of things and improve the kind of part of the process. Improve the quality of customer interactions. That could be external to internal customers, but I talk, call it the quality of the conversation. As analysts, the better conversation, the higher the quality conversation we're having with our subject matter experts, we're going to el elicit more ideas and opportunities to improve the process. Same with interacting with our external clients through customer service, asking those kinds of questions. The higher the quality of the conversation, the more opportunities to improve the process we're going to identify. Split the atom of the work activities. I've got a slide on that that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. But basically, all the work activities and workflow, anything we do, enter order, check credit, the thousands of things we do in an organization, we can take a deep, deep dive in any work activity and ask ourselves a question. What proportion of that work, that work activity is rules-based work? What proportion of that work activity is knowledge and judgment-based work? You'd be surprised, even at all the levels of the organization, how much work of any particular work activity that goes on is, is rules-based, mechanical rules-based kinds of things. And why is that important to identify? Because if I can identify the rules-based component of a particular work activity, I can distill it down to a, a procedure. And at a minimum, I could probably have that procedure performed at a lower level of the organization. And if it's really mechanical rules-based, I can probably automate it through robotic process automation and some other techniques as well. We're going to look at that in just a second. Modernize IT, you know, goes unsaid. There are a lot of opportunities, right? There's a lot of technologies out there that'll help us operate more effectively, more efficiently. I have a slide on that with just some, you know, a whole, whole cornucopia of technologies that you could take a look at and think about how that would apply to improving business, your business processes. Reduce, eliminate inspection work, right? Respection, inspections are you, you walk through the process and you have different control points along the process. A control point, a pro, an inspection by itself doesn't add value, say, and it consumes resources. And when I say it doesn't uh, add value or it doesn't change anything, but it traps a defect, right? Before it can propagate in a process. That's really what an inspection is all about. And what it really deals with is something called cumulative error. Cumulative error says as a defect propagates through process linearly, the cost of remediating that defect grows exponentially. Now, as we improve the process, we can reduce our inspections. So the higher quality of the outputs, the less errors, the less defects we have in the process stream. As we improve the process, we can reduce and sometimes even eliminate interim inspections. So take a look at that. Reviews and approvals. So <clears throat> inspections are uh, horizontal. Reviews and approvals are vertical. Organizations have, all organizations are structured in some type of vertical organizational structure. And so processes flow horizontally across the organization, across those vertical structures. So we have something we do, and we need a, you know the first level review or second level review. Maybe it's a purchase order, and somebody you create it, or you put out a purchase requisition, and somebody has to review that, and somebody checks that, and somebody checks that. It's been my experience that once you get past the first and certainly second level reviewer, there's very little value being created at that point. Right? So, so because the person is the fourth or fifth level, I mean they're so far disconnected, right from from the concept that they're probably the oversight there. So basically what I'm really putting out there is in the lowest, at the lowest level that decisions can competently be made, that's where decisions should be made. And as they propagate higher in the organization, there's less really, it's, there's too much of a disconnect. Improved data capture, just that simple. Data, data capture, uh, we wanna capture data, there's no question about it. Anytime we're hand entering data, that's the place to maybe look at an idea to maybe, can we automate the capture? Do we have uh, other uh, means of capturing the data? Is the data in other systems? Uh, there's all kinds of ways. So capturing data uh, through some mechanized uh, or alternative way versus hand entering data. Because hand entering data, very error prone, consumes a lot of time. So look at anywhere where data is being captured and let's look for opportunities to automate it. If we can't automate it, certainly let's build the ability to check you know check the quality of the data 
as it gets into the various systems. <clears throat> data access is really on the other side of it. <clears throat> what we really want to do is be able to provide people that need to make decisions access to the data that they need. To kind of use a, a it's, it's a pretty realistic example. If I see <clears throat> in a man somebody in a managerial position taking three or four, they got spreadsheet A, spreadsheet B, spreadsheet C. They're taking data from here, taking data from here, taking data from this spreadsheet, creating a worksheet out of it. And then they're using that worksheet to do some kind of analysis. You got a data access problem because that person in that particular role as manager trying to create a, a particular spreadsheet worksheet for decision-making by pulling data from different places. The time spent creating that spreadsheet out of other spreadsheets, that's not value added. That's just mechanical rules-based work. It's what they do when they have that data set that they use for anal analyzing. That's where value is created. So we want to, there's plenty of tools and technology for giving people better data as needed you know, at their fingertips. Uh, improve our metrics and KPIs. Right? The concept with uh, metrics and KPIs is we want to be able to uh, be able to, you know, to monitor the process, to monitor things we're trying to achieve. Uh, the concept there is uh, KPIs, uh, key performance indicators. We're trying to see where we are relative to where we want to be. Um, you know, these kinds of things. Are, are we, you know, ahead of where we want to be? Are we below? Can we take some corrective action? These kinds of things. So putting in a, a solid system of metrics, right? Things we're tracking, the key performance indicators will give us a lot of insight into the behavior of the process and where we are relative to where we need to be. And optimize supervisory activities. If I have somebody a supervisory managed position and they're doing a lot of hands-on work that's a little bit more rules-based, right? That's not effective use of their time. What I want to manage, that, that stuff can be put into procedure and delegated right, to to a lower level that you're managing. <clears throat> Manage, really the value added by supervision, managerial kinds of things is developing, uh, you know, developing uh, your, your team, uh, providing uh, insights onto some of the outlier conditions and these kinds of things. So uh, just you know, take a look at that, right? Uh, if, uh, if I got somebody in a manager or supervisor position doing you know, hands-on tactical rules-based kind of work, that's not a good use of their time. All right, so then we go, there's hundreds of things, but you know, there's just some things here to keep in mind. Now, two of them I just want to go a little deeper into. I call that splitting the atom of a work activity. So we have a sequence of work activities over here. Doesn't matter, it's just some business process. This work activity going on down the, the verticals, the uh, uh, horizontal flow here. We take each work activity, right? We take any work activity, and I mentioned, dig into that work activity. Ask what portion of that work activity is knowledge and judgment based, right? we got to make a decision about something based on experience and backgrounds and these kinds of things. And some of it's rules-based, right? That portion, and I guarantee almost every work activity you look at is going to have some proportion that's uh, rules-based and some that's uh, um, knowledge and judgment based. Separate those work activities. Here's the questions you're going to ask for, ask about. We look at a work activity and ask yourself, this portion, some portion of that work activity involves some level of manual work. Is that manual work rules-based? In other words, I'm following a fairly mechanical procedure. I'm not making knowledge and judgment. I'm just following, you know, turning the crank, following a procedure. Is it structured? You know, it's rules-based, follows a structured procedure. And is it repetitive in nature? Or I'm grabbing an invoice, I'm doing something with that invoice, I'm checking certain things on the invoice. You know, is it signed, it's dated, these kinds of things. It's just repetitive rules-based kind of work. If I can find those portions of a work activity in a workflow that meet those conditions, manual, rules-based, repetitive, follows the structured procedure, I can create, if the procedure has not already been developed, I'm going to crack, create that procedure through a procedure diagram of some kind. If I create a nice procedural diagram and really tight, I can then take somebody at a lower level, the next level down in the organization, train them, if I'm a supervisor or manager, train them to perform that procedure, take it off my plate and have them do it. If it's truly mechanical based, right, through bot robotic process automation, which is everywhere right now, right, I can automate it. It's just that simple and take the human element out of it. So the split, the split reduces labor costs, prevents human error, 
uh, speeds time to value, shifts the workforce. Uh, it gives more time for knowledge and judgment based work. So the results had more time to apply uniquely human skills. And as humans, what are we particularly uniquely, what are our superpowers, critical thinking, reasoning, interpersonal engagement, creative thinking, innovation, those kinds of things. So the more I can take off of somebody's plate and automate it or move it down to a different level of the organization, the more time I have to engage, right, in dealing with outlier conditions and difficult things and problem solving and those kinds of things. So something to look at, there's tremendous opportunity to split that atom, the work activity. <clears throat> the uh, IT enablers, I'm just going to pause here for a moment. We're not going to go through all of them, but what I want to do there is just give you kind of a sense of, of what's there, right? And maybe using some other ones as well, but it's just, there's so much opportunity to integrate uh, technology into our space. I just put into this list, you know, uh, I've had artificial intelligence there for a while under informational search and retrieval, right? Chat GPT and Jasper AI have just burst on the scene lately for, you know, aid search and retrieval kinds of things. My point is there's tremendous amount of technology out there. Uh, take a look at some of these things if you're not using them and uh, probably particularly RPA has become really mainstream as well these days, everything else. All right, let's move on. Last part here I want to talk about real quickly is technology, and not technology, strategy, <laughs> okay? And really what I'm talking about is the distinction between strategy and strategy execution. Uh, strategy is a hypothesis, really, of what is needed to win the future. Now, as business analysts, we're not probably not involved too directly in creating organizational strategy, but we have to have an awareness of strategy because we're going to be executing on strategy because strategy without execution is just an aspiration. So what we want to do is take that strategy and understand, okay, how does that impact my part of the organization? And what are the kinds of things they have to do to execute on that strategy to change our processes and systems and things like that? So the strategy is, you know, again, thinking about the organization. Use the box of a metaphor. Thinking about the box, outside the box, the size of the box, where it should be, you know, all those kinds of things, right? Thinking operationally, which is where most of us live, is working inside the box with the resources we have and the actions we want to take to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of the work we do. So execution is taking that strategy and making it actionable, which is that simple. Strategy is just an aspiration, it's a hypothesis. Strategy execution is where we squeeze value out of that particular strategy. And that's what wins the future. All right, so execution is implementing strategy, putting strategy into action. Bridges that gap between great strategy and operationalization of that strategy. And that's a big part of what we do as analysts, right? We're working in how do we make that actionable, right? It requires we have to understand the company's vision. We have to understand their strategy. We have to understand the goals and objectives. And, and we have to create that balance between, remember, uh, business process, incremental business process improvement with transformational change, something we're always balancing. We have limited time and budget and resources. So how much do we allocate towards transformational change, but how much do we also allocate in continually improving you know, what we're doing moving into the future? And a like, quote here from Jack Welsh basically says, change before you have to, right? Get ahead of the curve. Don't get behind the curve. Continually change and get ahead of those kinds of changes. Okay, that's what I got for you today. A couple of things here on, on wrap up. A couple of things and we'll get to Q&A. We're just about on time there. Uh, we're talking about a lot of things here. Come to our website, and we got lots of training programs out there. If you want to go deeper into any of those things, just go to uh, website uh, slash training. Uh, we have a, a really cool webinar coming up here in a couple of weeks. I really dug deep in the whole Southwest Airlines scheduling meltdown, and we're going to do a three-part webinar series that really talks about the meltdown, do some critical thinking about it, do some crowdsourcing of, of, of requirements for crew scheduling. So it's kind of a cool thing that we're going to do. So just uh, the link's up here as well. Just go to intakegroup.com and it says, I love SWA. I love Southwest Airlines, okay? So take a look at that as well. All right, we're right, uh, yeah, we've got 14 minutes. Uh, what are some, some questions we should be talking about here? Some Q&A kinds of things. 
Hello, uh, I'm back and I'm just going to uh, read out loud a couple of the questions that have come in. Um, I would encourage everyone on the call to type in your questions uh, using the Q&A chat so that we can make sure to uh, to find them and read them. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm actually thinking of registering for that Southwest Airlines uh, uh, webinar myself because it's uh, it was really uh, a, a complete disaster so um it'd be interesting to know what what happened there so yeah I've, I've, <laughs> I've done a lot of work in this space and i got a lot of insiders at southwest air that have given me some some of the inside scoop so it's it's, it's really going to be a fun three-part webinar uh but that no, sounds amazing yeah come come join us but do it soon because we're almost we're going to be at capacity here pretty quick all right what you, oh, okay. so, Q &A thing. good to know so here's a question that says how can we measure value created how do we measure value created well, there's 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 company value and there's uh, there's uh, customer and uh, company value, and so one of the metrics we use for value creation is simply how can we cost operating more economically, right? That's an internal factor that if we can maintain maintain our levels of effectiveness, so we have our products and we have our services, nothing new there, but we set service levels or, or I should say uh, service levels standards for quality standards for delivery. And so if we're meeting our service standards, our predefined service levels, and we're being able to operate more economically, right, more efficiently, if you will, then that metric is, I'm going to say, you know, what's the cost The cost of producing those outputs, right? It's, it's, it's a pretty clear metric because we're looking at a cost curve. I said earlier, money, money uh, flows towards treated best. And that part of the operations that is the most efficient Right, in providing the output for the client at those service levels tends to get more budget to continue doing what they're doing and, be, and, and to fund different initiatives. A customer value, external customer value, is generally measured in terms of the revenue curve. Are we increasing revenue? Are we getting more uh, sales from a current, current customers, you know, uh, customer returns? So we can really measure it pretty objectively through the, through, uh, the, the, the revenue curve. Right? And there's you know many other metrics as well, but that's really what we're looking at there. How is it impacting revenue? How is it impacting the cost curve? And uh, that's it. Okay, so that's a, that's, a, that's a great answer. And uh, the next question that we have is, is it up to the business an, uh, analyst to set the KPIs or is it up to the stakeholders? Yeah, I would say in my perspective, it's it's a job. It's a, I'm going to answer two questions here, even though one was asked. Um, as a business analyst, it's our job to identify uh, potential KPIs because we're, we're you know close to the, now you know it's not the job of a data scientist by the way and data scientists do really smart things right in business analytics all those kinds of things but our job is we're closest to the business right and that's so important we understand uh, you know what we're value being created and what are the kinds of things we're trying to achieve and looking at strategy so it's our job to look at potential potential metrics and KPIs. But ultimately that's going to be up to whatever level of the organization work at it. You know, a could be a, you know, a divisional manager, it could be a divisional VP, it could be whatever. So as as analysts, we're teeing up, I should say, here's some potential KPIs that I think and show line of sight. If we can measure this, that'll give us insight into, into this kind of thing. The other question I'm going to answer, not that you asked it, but I want to answer it. As a business analyst, it's also our job to create really great business cases. I didn't say use cases, I said business cases here. And it is our job to create use cases as well. But a business case is looking at something for decision making. Now, the point I want to make here as a business analyst, we're not making the decision, we're enabling decisions to be made. So a business case is not a sales case. A business case says, here's the thing you know somebody wants to do. Here's the cost for doing it. Here's the benefits for doing it. Here's the risk for doing it. Here are the risk mitigation kinds of things. I've teed it up, right? I've given you all the objective information for a decision maker to make decisions. So it's a similar kind of answer here is as business analysts, we tee, you know, we tee things up for people that need to make decisions to be able to make good, objective, informed decisions. All right, what else do you get for us? 
Awesome. So um, a few more questions are coming in fast and furious. Yes, um, yeah, here's yeah. one that says, can we call the metric that measures big E and small E simultaneously a productivity metric? James? Uh, yeah, I got I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, okay. Oh, okay, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I thought I had lost yeah, you. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. So I, I went silent because I'm thinking because, you know, <laughs> I don't have, yeah, I want to be able to answer that properly. A productivity measurement generally is looking at things like how much output did we get based on the input. So that's generally pretty, you know, like if we're looking at a, keep it simple. Well, it's not so simple, but looking at a particular machine. And a productivity would measure it says it has a theoretical, theoretical output. If everything is operating well, it's well oiled and tuned up and doing all the things it's supposed to do. This piece of equipment could produce a thousand units an hour. So the question then becomes, okay, if that's sort of the, 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 the aspirational notional kind of thing, but what are we producing? We're getting 800 units per, you know, per hour out of it. So we're probably operating, you know, 80% of productivity there. That would be a, that would how we look at productivity is uh, output, the amount of output relative to the input and that conversion rate. The question was in terms of uh, effect, that would be effectiveness of the machine. And then efficiency would say, in order to you know be operating at that level of effectiveness, how can we reduce the you know, how can we maintain that level of effectiveness? Maybe it's ninety percent or whatever, but lower the cost of it, and that would be an efficiency. So, so productivity is different. All right. So the, I think the answer is no. <laughs> okay, that's the short answer. Is productivity is really going to speak to uh, effectiveness, uh, and efficiency is the cost of producing that productivity. That's how I'm thinking about it right now. If I think about it for a little longer, I might have a different answer, but I would say kind of in the sh in the small little time box we have, I'd give it a no. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So um, here is a question from the, the chat. Uh, being on the customer side of business, dealing with vendor stakeholders, how can we identify identify who is a deal maker versus a value creator? Okay, in the context I, I, I came here is deal makers. Uh, we generally, as business analysts, in the context, we're usually not dealing with deal makers, right? Deal makers are people that are out there in corporate finance looking for opportunities to buy an organization, right? Now, here's our relationship of business analysts to deal makers: is that what a deal maker, right? So I'm in corporate finance and I'm looking for an acquisition candidate to to you know, add on to the business. Maybe it's a strategic acquisition of some kind of thing. Where a deal maker will reach in the organization and work with financial analysts and business analysts, and if it's a really sophisticated deal maker, they will reach in and, and engage the business analysis community. Because one of the things I wanna know as a deal maker, right, is how much more, can I, squeeze is not the right word, but what are the opportunities in a particular acquisition candidate for improving operational efficiency, right? And customer, the effectiveness of the operation. Because the bigger the gap between what that acquisition target is currently doing and what we could potentially do with it is gonna help me think about the pricing of that particular thing and how, you know, because, you know, if it's competitive and if I know, you know, I can squeeze this much more margin or operate more efficiently and create more value here, maybe I can be a little more competitive in pricing over here. I'm not sure that's the question that was asked, but I went to have a particular track here, but that's where as a business analyst, I'd probably be, be engaged by uh, corporate finance kind of people. Uh, that's my experience on that. Okay. So we've got about four minutes left. I'll take another uh, question from the, the question and answer box. And it says, what do, what do you find creates the best value for a customer in a government agency? Oh, that's good. Well, you know, I don't want to rate questions, right? They're, they're all good questions. What creates the most value for a customer in a government agency? Well, I do a lot, I happen to do a lot of work with government agencies. And here's, here's my take on that. Depends what the agency is. Um, some agencies, you know, are creating value for other agencies. Some are for the, you know, the general public. It depends. What we've seen a lot in, in government agencies of right now is a particular agency 
does map do something really well. Maybe a particular agency is really good at procurement, right? And another agency now will say, you know what, instead of us trying to be really great at procurement, this particular agent agency is really great at doing procurement kind of things. And they'll actually outsource, say, procurement to this other, other agency over here. Why? Because that particular agency is really, so really what it's, it's, it's almost like it's an outsourcing arrangement in this particular, so instead of having everybody doing procurement, we're going to leverage uh, you know, this particular organization. Um, so a lot of times, um, some government agencies have marketplace customers. And really the concept there is you have to set very clear and clear uh, setting your levels of custom, your, your service levels. And that's kind of a negotiation, right? You're going to have certain, you know, here's levels, here's, you know, the, the, our, the general public at large is utilizing our services. Uh, you know, what's the right level of service given the budget we have and these kinds of things. And uh, so we talked about earlier in a private organization or a commercial organization, we have the revenue curve, right, going up. In a government agency, we don't so much look at the revenue curve as we look at the budget. Right. What's the budget I have for this year, next year? Uh, and what's the most value I can create in that particular budget? I'm going to get back to my statement that money flows to where it's treated best. And if you're a government agency, in a particular segment of the agency, and the more value you can create for whatever you're doing, you're actually, it's been my experience that you've got a strong business case for getting more budget because you can create, because you're using your budget wisely and we create even more value if we get budget. So uh, again, sometimes I, I'm not sure if that answered the question, but as I understood the question, that's that's where I have to go with it. All right. So All right. we're down to uh, two minutes left. Um, let's do this one. What are your most favorite business analysis tools, top two or three that you have used the most often? Well, are we talking about like vendor tools or are we talking about like conceptual tools? And it just says business business analysis okay. tools. <laughs> let me let me let me. So let's take vendor stuff. We're not talking about like subscribing to a vendor tool. I'm a big advocate of anything visual, uh, process maps, right? Activity diagrams, uh, you know, data models, state transition. Anything that's visual, doesn't matter what what area you're working and doing things, make it visual. I call it going from analog to digital. Using just words to describe something is very it's can't go deep, people interpret it different ways, but the minute you create visual artifacts, like process maps, activity diagrams, all these kinds of things. So that's that would be my advice there. Let me inject one more thing. If I, if, if I have access to the chat, if you can send me the chat, I'll try and answer as many of these questions as I can between now and when you publish uh, this. So you'll have, so, you know, so anyhow. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I, I will forward you uh, all of the questions from the chat. They're a little um, more difficult to download than the Q&A, but not a problem. We can give it our best shot. Okay, that, in any that, case, that would be great. Go ahead. Yeah, in any case, we're uh, just about um, a few seconds away. Actually, it is already two o'clock. So um, just wanted to thank you so much, James, for such a great presentation mm -hmm. and uh, for your time and for your expertise. Um, the fact that we still have more than 150 people uh, listening in means that uh, that the, your presentation was quite well received. So uh, thank you to you and thank you for all of our audience today for being here as well. And uh, we look forward to hosting you again, James, in the near future. Okay, thank you very much. Well, it was a great group. And I see the questions are still coming in. And I'll answer yes. as many as I can between now and a week from now. Okay. Sounds great. Thank, thank you, you so much, much James. Yeah. And happy Bye -bye. Valentine's, everybody. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.